Dr. Sharfstein, when you talk about vaccines, and we've been talking about them for quite some time, is a bigger challenge to, you know, make sure that people feel safe in taking it. And I know New York has taken some steps in, in making sure that, that these vaccinations, these vaccines, once ready, will be vetted properly. W will it mean that people will want to, to take them? That's absolutely correct. I think that vaccine acceptance is extremely important because you can have a great vaccine, but if they say vaccines don't save lives, it's vaccination that saves lives, and people are going to want to have to take it. So um, what is what that's about is the confidence that people have in the process. And unfortunately, I think the White House has undermined that confidence by putting it in such a intense political context, and I think that's why there are a number of steps that both the FDA can take and others are thinking of taking to depoliticize it and just make it about, you know, the science in a way that can inspire doctors to feel confident and, as a result, uh, many people to feel confident about it. Professor, this came up four, five, six times this weekend. Let's get an update from you on a Monday as it gets a little bit colder out there. Will there be a shortage of other vaccines slash shots, like a so-called flu shot? Um, well, in a way, I'm kind of hoping there'll be a shortage because that'll mean that everyone's getting the flu shot. So we want to have as many people as possible to get the flu shot, particularly people who um, are at high risk for flu and particularly people who may not have gotten the vaccine before and can sort of get used to getting vaccines through the flu shot, um, which will protect them uh, during the flu season. So uh, unfortunately, there probably is not enough flu vaccine for the entire population. So people should go out and get the flu shot. And if we run out, we run out. And hopefully we'll run out, you know, on the on the early side to really try to um, protect as many people as possible from the flu. Explain the medicine of a given virus or bacteria overlaid on the likelihood of having great harm from the COVID virus. In other words, having both together. Yes. Is that what you mean? Well said. So, Clearer than me. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Okay. <laughs> sure. No problem. Well, I mean, there are a couple of problems, you know, it, you, that could come up. One is just many more sick patients. There are some years where the flu, you know, fills up the hospitals by itself. And then on top of that, you would have a pandemic. So that, that's a really scary scenario. I think it's less likely if people wear masks and keep their distance because the same things that keep people from getting COVID also keep people from getting flu. And in the countries in the Southern Hemisphere where people are taking a lot of precautions, they've had very mild flu seasons in their winter. So that's what we're hoping. However, if people disregard masking, you know, and are going out and doing their thing, flu could start circulating and you're going to see even worse problems there, both with COVID and flu. And of course, the process of getting medical care for flu will bring people in contact with people with COVID. And so, you know, I think either places are going to do relatively well on both or relatively poorly on both. Um, Joshua, what exactly are monoclonal antibodies? I mean, you know, fr from extensive reading, as far as I can make out, they're the, the, the guys that basically protect you, right? They're made in the lab and they protect you against inf infection. And what do we know about these monoclonal antibodies to fight COVID-19? Sure. It's a little bit like the plasma. You know, plasma is just people's, um, all the antibodies that people have are in the plasma. Monoclonal antibodies are trying to take either one or maybe a few of those antibodies that are thought to be the most effective to protect against COVID-19, and then they make a lot of them um, in, in a, um, you know, that they produce them. It's not taken from somebody. And, and the idea is that they could be given to people who maybe are just exposed to the virus but haven't even gotten sick yet, and they could keep them from getting sick in the first place. Um, it also could be used as an early treatment. And, you know, there's some uh, hints that, you know, out of the studies that, that they may be effective. So we'll have to see when the studies get reported. But that's another, like, tool in the toolkit to protect people. Is, is a virus now less deadly? And is it because we know how to treat it better? Or, you know, what's the difference between now and, and last March? Well, I think, uh, I don't think the virus has changed, I think, as much um, uh, it's possible. The virus may have mutated a little bit. Um, but more likely, it has to do with the fact that they're different. Uh, lower People at lower risk are 
getting the virus. So as a proportion of people getting sick, fewer people are dying. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that even though young people might get it initially, they can still pass it on to older people. And, and a few days after the younger people get it, older people get it. So there's still quite a lot of death. Um, I also do think that we're getting better at treating it. And um, that's a real tribute to all the doctors and nurses and others who are in there figuring out uh, new ways of taking care of patients um, and learning what didn't work and and trying out uh, different different kinds of things. We now have some very good treatments, particularly steroid treatments for people who are really sick, and you know reducing the mortality by half is a big deal uh, with steroids.